You get a couple seconds. Okay. I, I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Planning Board, uh, Littleton Planning Board, we have quite a few things on our agenda tonight. Uh, first item will be to update from the uh, master plan. Steering committee? The master plan steering committee. Um, Mary, do you, do you want to you report on that? Sure, I'd be happy add? to. Do you want that now, or did you want to review the rest of the agenda? Oh, well, yeah, we got we got the master plan. We've got the um, uh, Macintosh Lane, the or orchards. We got Wilson Lane at um, what is that? There we are. Uh, joint. We're going to start with the joint meeting, seven fifteen, with the board of selectmen. Then discuss the preliminary subdivision for Turkey Farm. Then move into Bennett Orchards, open space special permit at 745. 8 o'clock will be the public hearing, air road, modify uh, special permit uh, for, modify this, the special permit for a storage building at 830. We're going to have um, a major uh, commercial industry use special permit uh, hearing. It'll be for air liquid depot facility. And I believe that's it. So you had asked about the master plan update steering committee. Um, we got four proposals in response to the RFP. Uh, the selection subcommittee um, has invited and gotten confirmation that three of the, uh, the top three candidates will be in to interview next Wednesday, the 16th, starting at 6 p.m. So they'll be in this room, and um, all the planning board members are invited because eventually it will be your decision on which um, consultant to contract with for the master plan update. Great. And uh, so far, they, the uh, respondents look very good. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, let's see. We have, um, we'll postpone the minutes. Thank you. Okay. And uh, mail? Um, mail, uh, in, in the mail folder that I always bring to meetings, but um, we have a lot of uh, water quality reports from the groundwater monitoring that the water department is now doing on a lot of the industrial sites around town. Oh, great. Um, it, yeah, it's good to see those coming in again. God, it's been years since we saw those. It yeah. has. And good 10 years. Yeah, yeah it's, That's it's good. like I said, awesome to be seeing those again. How do the reports look? Um, most of them are quite clean. The ones that... Um, need further testing will be tested again in the spring mm -hmm. to give us an idea of if, if levels are increasing or decreasing or if it was an anomaly. That's great. So. Mm -hmm. And Bill's in peril, we did that. Yep. Yeah, so we're waiting for Peter. Thinking. And um, Okay, on McIntosh Lane and Distribution Center Circle, I don't have any new inspection reports. I had <laughs> when I post the agenda almost a week before the meeting, I leave space just in case they do come in that we didn't have any. Um, and then on Wilson Lane, that's a shared residential driveway off of Crane Road near Bulkley. Um, there's a bond in place. The construction is, uh, for the most part, complete. Um, Jim tells me that the stop sign and the street sign have been installed. As soon as the uh, developer sends an as-built in, we'll get that reviewed. <coughs> And at that point, I would imagine we'll get the request to release the bond. But we don't have the as built yet, so it's, the good news is the, the street sign was and stop sign were installed. That's great. So, yep. Any news? Any uh, news from the board members here? No. Nope. Derek. Or Ed. Ed. <laughs> I'm good. Nothing. Good. Nothing to report. Well, maybe we'll entertain questions from the public since we got a few, few minutes. Any, any, um, any news or any um, points of interest uh, other than the items that we're going to talk on the, on the meeting about. Nothing. It's quiet. Everyone's quiet right now. 
did um, Moe's open, right? So we might as well talk about yes. Point a little. Didn't we, did our first restaurant open up over there? Uh, yeah. yeah Moe's. Mm -hmm. So we, have, we finally have a, a new restaurant in town. And I heard that um, one of their first nights they did a, a fundraising function. For the, for the high school hockey team. Very nice. Yeah. It was very, very well attended and very successful. And then, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, I drove, drove in there the other day. They have a second level now yeah. that you can drive up to and around. Yeah, so it's looking real nice. It's going to be nice to finally get that done, get the movie theater in, get some more, a couple more stores. The movie theater, yeah. That look, that came to us last week, last month, and it, uh, mm -hmm. and it looks like it's going to be a, a really interesting building. Mm, it's going to be nice up there. So. Well, this time there's going to be Peter walking through. <laughs> so let's see. Um, in our, in our, we have five more minutes before um, our meeting with the selectmen. Keith, is there anything you'd like to add? Well, I can just uh, update you on a couple of uh, things that, that I'm sure is of interest. First, the uh, MBTA uh, has, uh, is implementing uh, service enhancements to the Pittsburgh commuter rail line starting next Monday. These are not the enhancements that they originally announced in mid-November, which they then canceled or delayed. These, this is their winter schedule, which adds a round trip uh, for the Fitchburg line, which brings our first reverse commute of the day from Boston to Littleton. It will arrive at 7.33 a.m., and that's one hour earlier than the earliest one currently, which is 8.37. Just a little over a year ago, it was 9.40. So mm -hmm. just in that uh, short progression of time, we've gone from 9.40 to 8.37, now to 7.33 as the earliest that uh, uh, folks coming from Boston can get out to Littleton. So we've been working with uh, IBM and others, uh, our Crosstown Connect uh, partners on uh, addressing the last mile issues uh, through shuttles and Uber and anything else to connect the train station with where people work. So that's a good, that's a great problem to solve and we appreciate that the MVP has come, come through on one of the tenets of our community compact between our town and the Baker Polito administration. So we're very happy to see that. That's great. And for List Littleton residents, that it, I said it was a it was a, a early uh, a round trip. That right now there's a gap between uh, somewhere between uh, uh, seven thirty and nine o'clock. There's a there's a there's a gap, and now there will be one that I think around. Eight, uh, the train leaving Littleton going into going into the city. So now all we need is more park parking. <coughs> more parking. That's it. Well, we have a beautiful station down there now. If anybody in town hasn't seen it, they ought to take a ride down. It's absolutely great. But you got to get there early for the parking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have 55, on a typical morning, there's 55 overflow parking spaces there. The MBTA had committed, and I got a reassurance from their rail and transit administrators recently, as a week ago, that the MBTA, MBTA still intends to restore 20, 25 parking spaces on its on the Mass DOT right-of-way uh, along the tracks. It, it's, they said, they keep saying prior to the winter, and I keep telling them that Winter's <laughs> fast approaching, but we'll stay, we'll stay on top of that. Oh, that's great. Uh, welcome, Peter. We were doing um, input from board members. Do you have any input tonight? Nothing. Nothing. No jokes? Nothing? Oh, I can I can hit some jokes, but I'm sure it's not that quite time of the year yet. Well, we have... Uh, yeah, it's about time. We have another minute to go, so I think, um, I think what we can do is begin the discussion with the Board of Selectmen on the K property, Chapter 61A, and the preliminary subdivision for the Durkee Tree Farm, 260 Foster Street, Grimes Lane. It's a proposed 36 open lot subdivision.
Who will speak on behalf of the uh, Durkee Tree Farm uh, subdivision? Let's start with the subdivision. Uh, update us on the subdivision, and then we'll go right into the uh, uh, the cave property. Um, uh, is Jim Carr here in the audience? Yes, he is. Um, and actually, you you have the plans in front of you. Um, maybe we could turn turn that turn that for the audience. Do um. So do you does the do the selectmen need to open? As a as a uh, okay. All right. So let's begin. So uh, when last we met, we um, you had engaged Green International to do a, a peer review. Group Green had issued a letter dated November 30th um, with their comments with regards to the, the subdivision itself. Um, we do have revised plans and uh, a response letter to that. Um, we pass out a package that has these uh, revised plans, which also is the same as the colored one, but inside the packet is a response letter to the green letter. And I see that Luke is here tonight, and I mean, he can speak to the comments a little later, but what I'll do is start <coughs> going into all of the individual comments. Um, <clears throat> we can save that for, for maybe later. Uh, just go over, kind of over some of the broad broad changes that were made that, that kind of came out of that and that letter and also out of um, the continued discussions with the uh, as we talked last time. We've refocused the corridor of the open space to along the, the westerly flank of the of the, the lot to buffer the Foster Street residence and also provide a, uh, a continuous open space to the the area of the K lot that the selectmen are looking to preserve as <coughs> as open space and to provide a kind of a seamless corridor down to uh, down to the railroad station. Um, tying into the, the town forest up to the north of, of the KPs. Um, out of uh, one of the uh, one of the issues that came out of uh, the last meeting and also directly on point in in the green peer review uh, was the emergency access through the K piece onto Foster, which is which is to the north and the condition of the, the Grimes Road intersection at, uh, at, uh, at uh, Foster, even as we were proposing to reconfigure it. They felt there was still some issues with its proximity to the, to the crossing. Uh, they suggested that we meet with uh, MBTA <coughs> and understand MBTA's um, requirements for that for that intersection. We did have a meeting on site with two representatives of, of, of the MBTA. I think one of Luke's points was maybe it should be moved further north. Maybe the intersection of Grimes should be moved, moved further north. Um, 
MBTA actually concurred with that and, and said to effectively eliminate the Grimes gate, uh, it would, Grimes would need to come in to Foster uh, approximately 100 feet north of the, the crossing. Um, Green had, had suggested maybe maybe we full build the the North Foster entrance um, as, as the primary entrance and look at Grimes as being the, the secondary entrance. So what we've done is is we've we've shifted over to, to that concept uh, of a full build road uh, from the north entrance. Uh, we've gone back to leaving Grimes in its in its current state as a possibility and utilizing that as secondary means of, of access and also eliminated one more lot from the from the project if you recall that we had the reconfiguration of crimes that kind of created a an island or a island lot that was between the farmhouse and a portion of grimes and the new and the relocated that lot's now been removed from the yield plan and from the uh, and from the OSRD. So the entirety of the south, south side of Grimes is now taken out of the project. The seven acres is, is set aside and um, not part of the project. And now we're, we're looking at 30 lots for both the yield and the, and the OSRD um, within, the, within the subdivision with primary access, uh, again, on that north, full build 20, 22 feet of road um, coming in from, from Foster and, and servicing the, the 30 lot. What that does is it gives us, um, it leaves Grimes in its current state. All the OSRD lots are pulled off of Grimes so that there's a continuous uh, open space buffer along Grimes, leaving Grimes in its, in its natural rural um, stone wall configuration. What we also have done is, is uh, parsed off five acres for the for the farmhouse, and we would look to to potentially market that to someone that would, would utilize the farm, and we would be willing to enter into some kind of a, a, a restriction on further subdivision of that, and some kind of a farm preservation type type restriction uh, that would that would also have possibly have some public access to continue to utilize or, or to, to accent that north-south uh, north south open space all the way from Grimes and the train station north through the K, K lot and um, and uh, again to, the, to the ultimately to the town forest. None of the none of what we've done is is stepped on some of the, the previous requirements or, or, or desires of the board with regards to north-south north, wildlife corridors, east-west wildlife corridors, those still are, are maintained within the, within the project. And essentially the, the project goal is the same, to try to develop uh, 24 to 26,000 square foot lots that will um, be able to be self-sufficient in having their own septics and <coughs> their own feedlots within the subdivision. We've also had uh, discussions with Public Works uh, regarding the country drainage idea, and um, essentially that's not palatable to the Public Works Department. They want curb and gutter, um, <coughs> basin. so we've removed that waiver from, from our list of waivers. Um, and we will go with uh, a conventional curb and, uh, and a cash basin system. What we are looking for uh, with regards to waivers, is um, 22 versus 24 feet of pavement, and Public Works is, is fine with that. Uh, the basic cross-sectional requirement, which lends it to, which which has to do with that that um, width of pavement, uh, street trees. We're looking at <coughs> going to, to more of a 40 to 70 foot on center uh, rather than the 40 foot on center. 
the other waiver we're looking for is, is granite curbing. We would like to do a combination of granite and uh, bituminous. Public Works is fine with that. We would use granite at the entrance roundings uh, and the <coughs> intersection roundings and possibly at uh, catch basin locations, low point loca locations to, to better channel the drainage and in other areas soften the, the, the look of the roadway with uh, Cape Cod. And the last one is uh, bituminous sidewalks instead of concrete sidewalks, again, to, to keep, try to keep that rural character. We did, a, we did talk to Public Works about going to four feet instead of five feet, and they weren't um, amenable to that because they've got a five-foot plow. So they want five foot, but they were okay with the distance. So, so that's a, a kind of a brief overview of the changes that have come out of our ongoing discussions with Public Works. MBTA, the green peer review, and rolling in some of, some of the comments. Uh, we also have made um, the requested changes to the yield plan. Uh, we've, we've added added the shape factors to all the lots as Monari wanted to see, um, and made some clarifications on the to the two reduced frontage lots that we had in there in regards to making sure or demonstrating that we were uh, that we were compliant uh, with zoning on those. Um, Very good. Any board members have any questions or comments? <coughs> Peter, Ed, Mark? Not right now. I think we need to hear about the K Pox and check some of this right. Um, well, if we could if we could just finish up with the, the comments and the history of this, um, then we can move into the K parcel. Um, I think personally, I think coming in from the north is a good thing. I think um, uh, going from twenty two to twenty twenty four down to twenty two feet with the roads is a good thing. Keeping Grimes Lane uh, natural is a good thing. Keeping the farm with five acres is a great thing. Um, in the open space. My only question about the open space is uh, how much of that is, is uh, upland space that can be actually used for trails and things? And could you get, uh, give us an <coughs> idea where that where that could take place? Motorcycle trails? <laughs> All wheelers? <laughs> well, so, it, when, when discounting the five acres Rocky. for the for the farm, we have uh, the, the balance of the open space is, uh, I believe it's 16.9 acres. Um, that we've got large open space, non-wetland here um, and here, and then down in here is is non-wetland open space. Um, How many acres is that to? Brian, do we have the breakdown of the open space? No, West. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll get that back to the board. Okay. And if the town would acquire the the K property. Where would where would uh, the most logical or likely connections be to the train station through the through this? Right through right through the western portion. Western portion. And okay. it's dry to dry, and then I think the the idea on the the K parcel was <coughs> what was the total on the open space to the west? So uh, if I may speak, Dave Guthrie, yeah. Grimes Road LC. Yeah. We we took this northwest corner, which which had uh, we had some good testing up here, but it also we, we looked at it as a combination of, of um, a view shed here from Foster, um, a wildlife corridor because there is, I think, 11 acres up here that we propose to set aside. Um, and then across, coming across what you would call Hergen or Hergay, uh, Subway Valley Trust has a, a rip of land across that that we are proposing to combine um, some land of ours from the 11 acres, I think it's a six or an eight foot strip cutting across here and then cutting up into what would be your town forest. So you, if you wanted to develop a trail system through your town forest, come across and combine with that Sudbury Valley Trust land, come into this area that also provides what we envision as a de decent wildlife corridor. We also had conversations with the selectmen that if K if the town were to pass on K and it is something that can be developed, 
that we would stay open to the concept of additional trail systems, whether it be down the roadway or through some open space um, directly from the town forest down to Grimes. So you'd have a couple different options, whether it be pedestrian or wildlife or a combination thereof. Uh, oh, that's, that's wonderful. Dirt bikes didn't come up in that meeting. <laughs> <laughs> any, any other Snow questions? Yeah. Well, isn't this subdivision contingent upon you purchasing the K property? No. So our deal with K here, it started here with this parcel here, which is our 50-foot access strip, which was critical for the Durkee parcel, obviously for second means. There's a P&S for this, which we have under agreement. It is conditioned on, we, we buy this when either the town buys K parcel, the 44 acres, or we buy it. Somebody needs to buy it, and then we're able to close on this. Yeah. Good. We might as well get right into the K property then. Do, let's see. <coughs> hey, do you want to uh, give us an update on, on what took place with the selectmen's sure, hearing the, on the, the K property? The selectmen uh, held a couple of uh, public hearings under Chapter 61B on uh, the, uh, whether to exercise or assign the right of first refusal. Uh, <coughs> that, um, and the, the board has. Uh, the, the board made the determination uh, at a public hearing earlier this week not to assign the right of first refusal to a to a qualified nonprofit uh, conservation non nonprofit, um, and we had explored that as an option because, as a practical matter, our right of first refusal expires on December 29th, and we are not holding a town meeting between now and December 29th. We had had a public hearing to get general public input. I'd have to say by uh, by contrast we had received we the summer we had received hundreds and hundreds of expressions of interest, letters, petitions uh, for another piece of property, uh, the Cooper Farm, uh, and it was a much decidedly uh, much less interest in the in the, in the K property. There, there is interest. If there, there's, there was plenty of interest in having the developer donate the property in Toto, uh, the, the, the developer uh, has expressed his uh, interest, his desire to donate 11 of those uh, 43 acres uh, for now, and perhaps if it becomes undevelopable, or if, or if after due diligence is found that the rest of the site's not developable, we'll hear again uh, from perhaps about a potential donation. But one of, the, one of the main reasons we wanted to come here to talk about the K property in Durkee and how they interact is that when we had, uh, the selectmen had invited uh, Mr. Guthrie to, uh, to give us a proposal of what's the best that he could do for us if we couldn't buy the property, what's the best he could do in terms of a donation. And he came up with uh, the, the idea of 11 acres along the, uh, um, along the uh, West. western side of the uh, of the lot, and he took the occasion to see where he would need that he that it would make sense to alter the subdivision plan that he'd already submitted you for Turkey by removing by creating an open space corridor or an undeveloped corridor. And so, since that affected your side of the street, it seemed like appropriate for us to get together and talk about it. We didn't want to have the Board of Selectmen uh, acting on, um, <coughs> you know, on, on, we're entertaining a host community agreement with the developer for the Cape property, and we didn't want to take final action on that without consulting with you, since the, since from a global perspective, this proposal also affects Turkey. But if, if we're on the same page that what you see there is sort of an open space corridor along uh, Foster Street makes sense, then I, that would, I think, clear the way for the Board of Selectmen to act at its next meeting on, on uh, to deal with the donation. That's great. All uh, right. Anybody, uh, any comment? From well, uh, Mr. Cosby, thank you for taking the time and the considerations that you've given the town. I think the 11 acres is more than generous. I think the um, wildlife corridors is very important. The open space that you're offering the town is something that we like to see before us. So what I've seen so far is amenable to me. So anybody else? Mark? So far, so good. I'm 
still concerned about what's going to eventually happen with this parcel and the K piece together because obviously you're planning on connecting the two of them together and coming out through this to the next piece. So I think if we're going to look at this, I think eventually we're going to have to look at it in, in total with the K parcel as well. If I think it makes sense to look at it that way. Let me put it that way. Mm -hmm. How many acres are south of the uh, the Grimes Lane over towards the and then would be left? 7.1? 7 .1. 7 .1. Those, so those abut the train line for the most part? Train and the highway. So that falls into the 61T or whatever it is, or 40T. Is that right? Uh, 40R. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's something like that. Something to do with uh, and would that be taken out of the, the mix entirely in perpetuity, or is it just out of the discussions right. for now? So it's, it's currently RA, it's a zone, so there's no overlay that applies yeah. specifically to it for a density increase. We pull it out because we, in our discussions with this board as well as the Board of Selectmen, there seem to be um, um, different interests from different parties. So we pull it off the table, not in perpetuity, but for now, to let that run its course to see what best suits the needs of the town as well as our needs quite yeah. honestly so make makes most sense um. <coughs> so uh, could I mention on that point mr. chairman <coughs> please uh, uh, chairman uh, Jim Carr from the selectmen is, was not able to stay for this meeting as well uh, he, um, but uh, we had attended a meeting with the chair uh, and, and Mr. Guthrie and others earlier to, to sort of talk about the how these two pieces fit together. And one one of the things that it was hoped that the two boards could discuss amongst themselves and, and try to come to some conclusion, not tonight, but at least be aware of it, is that if given the proximity of that uh, of the lower property, the southern property, to the uh, Railroad right of way, and it's uh, short. It's just a few steps to the um, to the commuter rail station. If you were thinking about other uses for that property, including a field, and there's certainly you know we need, town certainly needs a lot of all fields in town. There's no there's no doubt about that. But there's also lots of places where you could put a ball field, and probably only one place that you can put commuter rail parking, and that is in, next to the commuter rail station. So the hope was that there could be some discussion and consideration of whether, uh, if the if the property were available, uh, to and uh, whether on a temporary basis or long term or whatever, that it might be worth our exploring with the developer, the two boards together exploring with the developer, whether there was some scenario where it made sense to to see if we could get maybe a hundred unit rail spaces out of here. But there's as I mentioned earlier, there's there's plenty of overflow parking already uh, at the station. There's typically 55 on any morning that are legally parked. It may be some time before the MBTA is able to commit to building an additional facility on its property. And so it, we at least wanted to be able to have a discussion about whether commuter, additional commuter rail spaces on as part of the development was appropriate or not. That's, that's it. Oh, that's that's an interesting uh, something to look forward to in discussion. <coughs> so, um, I guess in a in a nutshell, Keith, that means the uh, what you said earlier about the the option for the town to buy the case property is is going to um, is not going to go that, forward. That's correct. That deadline will pass yeah. without in order to. Uh, to uh, exercise a right of first refusal, it requires either that we assign it to a nonprofit, uh, uh, or that the town meeting go to acquire it. And either of those things would have to happen by the 120-day deadline, which is the statute, which is which is uh, December 29th. Yeah. So that leaves um, that means that the, the more than likely the K property will will um, will go to uh, Mr. Guthrie, the developer. Is that correct? That, that based on the two scenarios that, that Mr. Guthrie outlined earlier, I would weigh heavily on the scenario where Mr. Guthrie purchases that property. So Very good. Because the average, average yes. Be. Well, I think from what I've heard from Mr. Guthrie, the uh, in terms of the open space and the and the eleven acres, I think I'm I'm uh, 
very much in favorable favor of that that action too. Mark, no, so far so good. I mean, we have to see what it's how it's going to play out with not just the Durkee piece, but the the K piece too. In terms of the um, density, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <coughs> how much development is going to be pushed that way too? Well, this this is is pretty much uh, this preliminary uh, hearing for the subdivision and and uh, and so tonight we'll. Will either I think I'm happy move to, that to postpone or to uh, make a decision on this. I like the idea we're down to 30 lots, um, as opposed to the 37 or 39 yeah. that we talked about. Uh, there is still obviously some concern over both ways in there. Um, the the K parcel, which is not a roadway. I mean, that's still going to have to go through subdivision control to be <clears throat> for us to approve that, and what ultimately is going to happen to Durkee Drive. So. It's a good first step, but we've got a ways to go. Mm. The uh, in terms of the the layout and the uh, configuration of the, the lots. Uh, you know, I'm I'm still a little concerned because a lot of it is still the wetlands we were going to get anyway. But with the 11 acres with K's and everything else, I think Mr. Uh, Guthrie is um, is slowly coming our way. Let me put it that way. But we're going to hear from Luke uh, probably shortly on on uh, his. Uh, we should see what the neighbors think. Yeah, let's. Uh, well, we'll, shall we hear from Luke first, and then uh, if you could uh, give us your um, report on your site visit the other day? Sure. Um, yeah, Luke Boucher from Green International. Um, <coughs> basically, based on uh, this is the first time I see uh, the, re the revised plan, so it, it appears based on the, the uh, based on the presentation by Hancock Associates that they have addressed it, uh, actually a good, a good number of, of our comments. So, I mean, I can't really comment on what is remaining. It seems like it wouldn't be a real good use of your time for me to run through a bunch that may already have been addressed or, or that sound like they have been addressed. Uh, we were on site, I guess it was probably two weeks ago, mm -hmm. and we, we, you know, we walked the, uh, we walked through that, that wetland area where the proposed uh, at the time it was a uh, an emergency access now it's the main main access drive and uh, I, I agree with their location where they are proposing that that wetland crossing there is a slightly narrower spot where they could have crossed but it's based on the roadway alignment I, I, I concur with their their alignment the <coughs> at the time that we walked the, the property the layout of the subdivision was slightly different, so I, you know, I can't really comment on, on some of those things. In our review of the uh, density yield plan, we uh, we concurred with their uh, with that layout and with the number of lots that they said that they you know could reasonably achieve on that. We reviewed the uh, we reviewed the test pits for the four lots, I believe it was. Um, the, the four lots that were selected as potential problem lots, and we reviewed the test pits, we reviewed the uh, septic, preliminary septic uh, layout, and uh, we concurred that those, are the, that those are feasible lots. So other than that, um, I, I, I have to kind of reserve any further comment until you know, we actually get, get, you know, until I can start running through the plan and sort of checking off things again. That's great. The, uh, the biggest question was whether or not those lots were, were viable, and it sounds like they are. So the, the reduction from uh, the reduction down to 30 lots and the fact that those are viable lots, I guess, answers, answers a big question that was out there. Um, there were a couple other things. Sorry. Oh, that, that, please. That, uh, you know, there was a couple outstanding items that, I, you know, don't necessarily applied to me, maybe wait a second, um, the ownership of Grimes Lane, uh, as far as I know, I haven't seen anything, um, as far as I'm aware, that's still an outstanding issue. And then, actually, so uh, Mark, you had some questions about, uh, you know, the future development of that cave parcel. Based on what we would anticipate, the number of lots, you know, ballpark, 
they could get out of that, you know, if it were to be residential, it wouldn't change, and, and this is kind of covered a little bit in, in the letter, it wouldn't change the level of traffic impact study that they would need to do. Based on the number of blocks that they're showing here, they'd have to do a moderate, uh, you know, a moderate level traffic impact study. You add on the, the K property, it still falls into the range <coughs> of moderate. So that doesn't really change anything. The, um, the roadway width, uh, in terms of, you know, what, are, what the appropriate roadway width would be, similarly, you know, this property, uh, this development would qualify as a minor street. You add the other one in, you're still in the range of minor street. So you're still in the, what is typically, um, based on the subdivision regs, a 24 foot wide, you know, pavement. Um, but other than that, I mean, so in terms of that other development, they are kind of already in the, in the definitive, you know, when they would have to submit that traffic impact study, it kind of is going to cover. Okay. You know, yeah, so the More question. More or less, you know. Yeah, I mean, the they're not going to, they would likely not. Uh, it's going to re require the same level of impact study, but it's going to be up to them in their traffic impact study whether or not, you know, they factor that in. But it's the same level. So that, that was the question. If, um, if they, the developer were to, were to acquire the K property, <coughs> were to utilize this roadway system to exit onto Foster Street, would that mean uh, wider roads? Would it mean uh, bigger study? And it seems like the road systems here would be able to right. but the, the proposed be adequate. Road, the proposed roadway system. Yeah, I mean, it, w it would still be a minor street. Yeah. Rhymes Lane is obviously, uh, that's pretty narrow. So yeah. if that were to be considered a second means of egress for both properties, that would be a concern. Great. Um, and the, f the final question I was uh, going to ask, and I think you alluded to, was the ownership of, of Grimes Lane. Um, and Sherry, are you prepared to speak on that tonight? We sent a letter to this board and to town council, um, but since the configuration of the primary entrance has changed, I don't think the ownership of Grimes becomes as critical anymore because they're not planning to relocate or improve it in any way. It's an existing roadway, whether it's public or private, um, if it's just going to be used, it doesn't seem to matter. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and actually, on that point, what I would recommend is that has been brought up during the discussions on the preliminary, so they're well aware that it's been an issue. And um, if any more information they want to provide at the when they submit a definitive submission <coughs> application, they have to prove that they have control over all of the property that's being subdivided. <coughs> so that will. Some of that would fall under that. So Brian Williams does have to be decide whether it's it's a road, it's not a road, who owns it, who doesn't own it, because that is still part of the subdivision, what you just said, correct? Legally, the ownership of Grimes is the K, um, sorry, uh, the, it's the Durkee family. They're, they're, there are two trusts that hold it jointly, but they're the same uh, individuals who are in the trust, the Durkee family, Agnes and Sid. And um, there has never been a dedication of that road or taking by the municipality. There is evidence that it has been plowed by the town and there's evidence that the uh, state has given the town some funding for it. But there is legally no record of the registry of deeds that it belongs to anyone but the Durkees. In, the, in whatever case, if, if it were <coughs> decided that you wanted to pursue that you maybe thought it was a town way, then um, the only additional thing that they would need to make any improvements would be permission from the town. So it's not a big hurdle if, if you were to go that direction. So to attach the K property to this, you're going to basically take the last cul-de-sac, the last turnaround from there and tap off of that to go into the, into the Durkee property, or you intend to use Grimes Lane for, for the uh, K property? We're, we're unsure at this point because we, we haven't really proceeded deeply into due diligence on K, so we're not that far along without, you, have, you know, we don't want to spend a lot of money not knowing whether the town is going to buy it or not, so um, we'll proceed with that if, in fact, the town does not. I think the likelihood we'll to, after tonight is going to be that the town's probably not going to buy that property. Uh, we've already played with that game, so. Yeah, I think they say it's not over till it's over, so. Yeah. Um, 
We have a few more weeks. Yeah, we'll wait. Grab and your then, saddle. Let's go. And then proceed with, um, you know, our, our our due diligence on Kay. Okay. Well, well, yeah, but it is kind of a critical piece to this one because the frontage on Foster, that's part of the K. That's part of K's now, and it's part of the the, part, the stuff that the town of Logan has first right of refusal. So, in order for us to go forward with this, you have to, you're going to have to own that that piece. Well, so the town does not have first right of refusal on this this entrance here. It's not 61 Chapter <coughs> 61 land. What the K family did was tie us into both parcels, My tie someone into this <coughs> parcel. So we we have a purchase and sale agreement to buy this piece. It is exercised when somebody buys this piece, you or, or us, the larger parcel. So if you buy it, we buy this. If we buy it, we buy this. So either way, they're separate agreements. You don't have the option to buy the 50-footer because it wasn't chapter land and it wasn't contiguous chapter land. Well, I think that's the kid, not the, the quite. The property that we've been on, that <clears throat> offered does not have frontage on Foster. But the, the reason that it's still K property is because back in... 91 when the land reverted back to Charlie K this piece this isolated piece was not uh, it should have been when it was divided it should have been a separate parcel in and of itself but when it reverted from ownership by Barkus and K all the way back to Barkus it became part of that bigger parcel so it I think you could argue that it is part of the 61A that it is critical to this and that it's the town of Littleton still has, I would think, that still has, we need, it's unfortunate that Chris is gone now, but it was, you know, the only way it ever, the third floor. only way it was ever created was through the, yeah. through the, sub, the A and I's on the frontage, on the front I, lots. I don't have any, I mean, town and council reviewed the PNS agreement, he's reviewed the 43 acres that were offered to us, and we haven't had that issue come up at all, so it's, it's, Oh, excuse me, Mark uh, Sherwood Gold for the uh, applicant. It's not that way. They are two separately deeded pieces of land. They're not contiguous. They don't merge in any way. But that piece was never deeded. That's my point. No, it was. No. Yeah, I, I worked on the title search on it, and it, it was deeded. It was deeded out to the Barkas Group, and then the Barkas Group deeded it back to the K Group. That subdivision that occurred on Foster Street was originally owned by Walter and uh, Walter, it's Walter Barkas and Charlie K. And when the subdivision, when they were done as partners in that subdivision, uh, Mr. Barkas, I think it was just Walter, I don't think it was Walter and Lois, deeded back to the case separately. In 1991, yes. The land that was left. Oh, well. The, the point is that piece is critical to this piece, so. Yeah, and what I'm saying to you is... Only through the agreement between the K's and... The crime down at the city. That's the only part that's critical. It's not the fact that it's two separate pieces. The, the, it's just the, the sale of those that, pieces. And the arrangement that the case made was they didn't want to be stuck with property that had um, that was in the in the back over there. They wanted to know that either the town would buy it under the 61A or the applicant would buy it. So the applicant made them an offer to say, if the town doesn't exercise, then I will buy. But it was ir irrespective of the front. Okay, well, I mean, now, well, now it doesn't answer, but it, now is no. not the time to. The, uh, do, when they come back for this preliminary, when they come back for the final, now they'll have to have all that hired up. No, I agree. Yeah. Um, shall we open it up to the public? Please do. Any questions from the public on uh, the K property or this uh, Turkey Farm property? Okay, none. Hearing none. <laughs> going once, going um, twice. Yeah. Uh, there we have a couple of hands up. Yeah, why don't you, why don't you have have a model along? The board on, on the, you have enough direction from the board on the design issues? Yes. All right. Could you identify yourself for the camera? Sure. Don McIver, 43 Foster Street. Sure. Are we going to be hearing more about the K? I've heard some amount, but I, is this the, the full amount we're going to? Hear about the K property tonight? It, it appears that if the um, town does not exercise the rights to buy the K property by the end of the month, uh, the next time we'll hear about the K property will be from the developer with a proposal to construct, I presume? Well, if I'm not mistaken, um, the Slackman is considering this again Monday night? 
the selectmen will act. One of the things that we wanted to accomplish was by touching bases with the planning board tonight that the board of selectmen would then be able to act on Monday night on uh, the uh, on the matter of the donation of the 11 acres of K. And uh, we, we have a draft host community agreement which would also include a waiver so he doesn't have to wait till the 29th, the waiver of the right of first refusal. Um, does that answer your question, um, Don? <clears throat> well, I mean, it sounds good as it's going, but, you know, details are details. I, I hear there are going to be 11 acres that was initially suggested towards Foster Street, and one of the things I had suggested, which sounds like everyone's sort of agreement with, is to widen that path below the Hergay land to the town forest and then talk about possibly dropping it straight down south to the Grimes Lane. And that all sounds good. Um, so where's the decision? <coughs> Initially there was 11 acres, so there will be fewer acres now on Foster Street, but some will be stretched uh, sort of eastward to the town forest and maybe southward down to Grimes Lane. I, I just wasn't clear on <coughs> what was suggested. The commitment that we're able to make at this time is the 11 acres in the northwest corner, and part of that 11 acres is probably five or 10,000 square feet that runs in that trail system from here and up. It's eight feet wide times a thousand feet, maybe. They will connect you to the town fort. That's the piece we could commit without jeopardizing our $850,000 investment in here. We did commit publicly, and I'll do it again tonight on the record, that if, if we are, if this becomes a feasible piece for subdivision, and we can develop, we, we would be open in working with the board to create some sort of trail system from the town forest down the Grimes directly in conjunction with the parcel that exists over here. So, or at least allocating land, not necessarily constructing, but allocating land so that, that if there is eventually, and I understand there's some hardships in developing a trail system through the town forest, but if you were to create that, that you would have an area set aside to connect down the Grimes directly and or run across the uh, Burger piece and through that 11 acre space right. as well. So that sounds very good. That's, that's helpful. Just to <coughs> push in a little bit more, um, what's likely to be the, the the width of the trail or access to the town forest? Do we have any sense of that? Six or eight feet. Oh, okay. Well, I that I, yeah, I thought I heard eight feet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions from the. Uh, we have yeah, one of the back of the room. Switch Rignoni 242 Foster. The, the access from Foster Street, is the ownership of that land clear? And if so, could you tell me who owns that piece? Where, where they're going to be coming in from Foster? Well, uh, currently, uh, the council says that it is. Um, I believe one board, at least one board member, has some questions on it. This is a preliminary subdivision. Plan. We just approve it in concept. Um, that when they come back to us with a permanent subdivision, then they have to have all those uh, uh, legalities uh, finalized. So that it have it would have to be provable by then. Are you talking about the the roadway? Is that the, yeah, yeah the roadway, yeah. the access road right in from it. That's yeah. the one I was. That's yeah, the one same I was one. About. Yeah. All right. Any other any other uh, so, questions from the audience? So, if there were any other information that he had that's different than what we what you've heard, you'd want to get that from from the neighborhood. Do you have any information as to who the ownership of that, sir? Um, I've got the first engineering deed. I, I'm just to the south of it, and it shows it as a construction easement, but it's really for my property. I have that with me if anybody wants to take a peek. Um, I don't know if it means anything. It's 1977. And it's a construction easement? Yeah. Does it have a beginning and end date to it? Um, no. Um, I can bring it forward if you like. Are you the lot right next on the other side of I'm it? Just to the <coughs> south of it. Could so you leave it with us, please? Could, could you leave a, uh, a yeah. forward um, a copy to our yeah. our office and we'll have council take a look sure, at it? Okay. Yeah, <coughs> both council. I just want to speak to that. That deed was submitted with my letter to town council. That construction easement is a 15 foot right in addition to the 50 foot onto the property north and south uh -huh. to construct the road. It's a temporary easement for anyone constructing the road to go onto this gentleman's property and the property to the north to make sure you can do your grading. Okay, it's, it sounds like it's already accounted for. But if you want to uh, bring a copy to our, our office, that'd be great. We can co corroborate that. Okay. That'd be great. But if I may, one of the first things we did, obviously we're going to spend millions of dollars out here. One of the first things we did, 
and we firmly believe Sherry's the brightest attorney in the area. We had two other attorneys look at this, and, and title examiners as well, title insurers, to make sure that we have the right to buy this and the right to use it, because without this, the project's done. So to come out here and spend hundreds of thousands on Mr. Pesnola and then millions of dollars on the land would be foolish not knowing whether or not we could come in here or not. So we're yeah. very, very confident that that's a parcel we have the right <coughs> to buy. Great. Well, um, any other comments? If hearing none, um, board members? <coughs> Set. Could we, uh, Marin, the next step is to uh, close this hearing? No, and it's not a hearing. It's just a meeting. It's a preliminary. Mm -hmm. Sorry, um, are you ready to vote on the preliminary? I believe we are. <coughs> is it really a vote or it's a determination that we would rather see an open space plan as opposed to a conventional plan. Uh, that would be part of it and if there's any specific directions you have on, on the design uh, on top of you know what's been done so far. Well the waivers that would um, the 22 foot versus 24. We don't need to section. discuss that now. Yeah we don't have to. Yeah. 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 But I mean we but we, we discuss it at a future date. Okay. Right. Yeah. Once we get the definitive we can talk about that. So right. I'd pretty much like the looks of it. Well, it looks fine to me. I'm in, I'm in favor of, of most everything they showed me, so my opinion okay. is done. Thank you. I think you should look at the open space as opposed to conventional. I think it's you've done a night. You've listened to what we've had to say and have um, given us a lot of what we want. Not everything yet, but we're getting that. there. And then <laughs> you're all set. I concur with what both men said. Yeah, I think this is. I think this hits it right on, on target. Good. Right. Well, thank you for your your input and, yeah. and your time. Thank you. Uh, do we want to? Do we want to take a vote on this? No. no. We could concur. We've already done that. Statements no, think, made. Move on. What's next? Move. Okay. You have our okay. consensus. Thank you. Think we should, uh, think we should. Thank you. No. No. Thank you very much for coming in tonight. Thank you. How are you? No, we got cigarettes. Well, I, was, I read it the other night to see if it was uh, Matthew Harding's relative. But it's not. Okay, if you could. What's next? Come on. All right. Richard, tell him to get out of here. Can we take the discussions out of the room? We've got to continue, to, we got to, uh, continue our meeting here. Uh, Thank you all stuff for coming natural. tonight. Next. Uh, What's that? I'll give you this next part of the three numbers. So. Okay. Good. Where are you going? The Reader's Digest plan, right? Yeah, have some fun. All right. Oh, I can't eat that. I'm diet. Yeah, I'm beginning to wonder if she's putting stuff in it because they're not sealed when we get them. Okay, we're good. I'll see you guys later. Yeah. You leave it? All right. Um, the next item on our agenda tonight is the Bennett Orchard uh, Sanderson Open Space Special Permit to confirm an administrative correction uh, regarding setbacks. Um, who, who's, who is here to... Speak for the proposers. What number is Chairman, this one? I'm Paul Alf, and I'm an attorney from Westford. So I don't qualify in David Guthrie's characterization of the best attorneys in the area. <laughs> and um, I represent the Oak Hill Road Trust. And perhaps um, Aaron's already given you a uh, outline of what's happening, but essentially um, Jeff Brem was working on the septic plans. He was trying to fit the septic systems into the lots that are inside the Bennett Hill subdivision and he said how can we do that I just took a close look at the setback requirements for the uh, in the decision and the minimum setback in the Edward Drive lots is 25 feet he said uh, I thought we had agreed to 15 feet for the side setback of 10 and the minimum setback of 15 except by bylaw if the street abuts an existing public way or open space a setback is 30, uh, excuse me, 40. And I said, I thought we did too. I looked at my meeting notes, and that's what it said in my meeting notes. With Marin's help, we got the DVD of the planning board meeting. You know, I watched the DVD of the planning board meeting, and that's uh, what I uh, interpreted to have voted at the planning board meeting. 
And so we think that there was a uh, typographical error in the decision. And we uh, submitted a request that that be corrected to have it match the vote that was taken at the planning board meeting. And we submitted some language to Tamara for the possible inclusion in a decision just to correct the setback requirements so that they would read the Edward Drive lots that's 8 through 28. Those are the ones inside the, the loop road in the middle of the subdivision would have a minimum setback of 25 feet from the street, minimum side and rear setback of, excuse me, of minimum setback of 15 feet from the street, minimum side setback 10 feet, uh, minimum rear setback 15 feet for principal buildings in the lot and 10 feet for accessory buildings. Um, except no building shall be erected within 40 feet of any uh, open space. Allen Road, same thing. <clears throat> and for Oak Hill Road, those are the lots on the existing public way. And uh, Lot 32 on uh, Whitcomb Ave, those setbacks would be 40 feet from the roadway, uh, 10 feet in the side yard, rear yard, 15 feet for a principal building, or 10 feet for an accessory building. So we're making that request because we believe it's consistent with the vote with the vote that was taken by the by the planning board. And you're going to say, well, that was in the draft decision. Didn't you read the draft decision? I said, of course we did. But there was so much to read that perhaps we didn't see the forest for the trees. And we were reading word for word, word line for line, and Jeff and I missed the language regarding the numbers regarding the setback. Um, so here we are. Does anybody have any issue with the uh, corrective? Um, What's the, foot? The, I think isn't our setback now thirty feet from the from the street? But this yeah this is this is, we can do this because of it was a special permit and, and open space plan. Right There's, now we have a thirty foot setback. There's right? no setback yeah. requirement for cluster subdivision. Yeah. Right. And and at the if you remember we had this discussion at the one of the public hearings and the question was not how far it's going to be back from the property line but how how far back from the side of the roadway. And, yeah, um, and, and went through that, and it's. And I thought we went. Bec I thought it was 25 feet from the road because by the time you put the dry the uh, sidewalk in there, which is five feet wide, you're down to 20 feet away from actually pavement. I thought it was 25 feet. Yeah, I I'm remembering 15 feet, and, and the reason for that is because it pushes the the buildings closer to the road, leaving more open space in the back. It was open space was the, the was, concept to. Do the, you recall any of that by any chief? Jimmy, <coughs> call any of this? Yeah. I almost it, brought, you know, my computer with the DVD loaded to, to well, show you. Why didn't you? I guess I will. Do I have to come back and do that? I will. Yeah, do hustle off and come back. And, uh, All right. We'll see what I'm, Okay. What? We can. Let's discuss uh, what the ramifications of it are. Right. It, it's really, <clears throat> do we have a problem with the front setback or is it really the side setback we have an issue with? Shouldn't, shouldn't have any issue <coughs> with either because... Well, if they if put they, if they if they stack two of them together on one side and leave a bigger spot on the other because the lot is you got more X Y space. then is Y a place to be you know so two guys are, are shaking hands through the bathroom window but the other guy gets to throw something out right but you know you end up with more open space on every other lot and that was the the goal of this because this this well, is no, it's really not open space in the lots the lots are tiny there's they're you know they're you know they're not a, they're not an issue. Um, it's the issue of whether you can fit everything on the lots that you propose. That's why you need. We the can't septic. we can't fit the septic systems and the houses on the lots See, the way that they're written because they are small lots. Being in a cluster subdivision, yeah. we're trying to put five uh, ten pounds of potatoes in a five pound bag. Yeah. Right, and and these numbers here are the same as Jeff had presented at the meeting at the time. Yeah. Line. Yeah. All right, so, so you're sure is, this, we've already gone through this as a full board. We had this discussion. Yep. You recall? This, um, this is just to corroborate Mark, what we've discussed. Yeah, I, I don't think we ever had an issue with the middle of the loop. If I remember correctly, when we talked about it, we fluffed over it real fast because there's an open space. We didn't have a problem. We didn't realize that you were going to have such a tight issue with, with everything that goes inside these lots for the septic and the... Uh, and where the houses lay out, so. It, it, by you look at this, this drawing here, there really is not 
Where do you see these big giant open spaces, two there opposed no and two space. apart? No, these two are close. It's a very tight subdivision. But by, by, and pulling by doing all that, we ended up with a lot more open space. Is that what yeah. you're telling me? But it's me? only yeah. the inner sure. loop we're talking about. Yes. And not telling me fibs. You know, the great thing about this is by the time we were done, everybody was very pleased with the open space and how the yeah. open space was, was ultimately laid out or preserved the important characteristics of the land. That's right. But this is, we're only talking about the inner loop here. More or less. There's some minor adjustments in some of the others on, in, as far from the original decision, but the principal issue is the lots inside the Edwards Drive loop. That is correct. Right. It's okay. inside the lollipop. Because they're inside right. the lollipop. Right. It has so. nothing to do with ones uh, out on the... Uh, the, the ones out in the street remain uh, 40 feet from the front yard, from the, you know, from the street. Uh, side setbacks of 10, but those are, those are full-size lots. And minimum rear setbacks of 15 uh, for the principal building or 10 feet for an accessory building. All right, I'm good with it. And then it. you've got the three lots on Allen Road, yeah. the, the smaller. Yeah, those are fine so, as they yeah. sit. Those so, are all. So I would entertain a motion to um, approve, to re reiterate that uh, the, oh, the, well, it was what I remembered, so mm -hmm. we're right. just reiterating or amend. Uh, depends on what you remember. Uh, approving the correction. <laughs> approving the correction to 15 foot from the street, 10 foot, yeah. uh, 10 foot from the side, and. Um, well, just uh, as stated in the correction. Yeah, as stated. Okay. For the inner loop. motion to. Uh, I'll make that motion. To approve the <clears throat> the corrections as stated in the uh, document. So we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Not hearing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much for your Thank understanding. You. you have your confirmation. Yeah, yeah. Lucky good. that you did such a good job and you're such a good attorney that we let you slide on this. Uh, I appreciate that very much. I'm glad the re record reflects that now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Your tail showing. <coughs> Yeah. Nice. That was more bullshit today. I was going to go over the original fluff right through it because we never thought about it. You know, it's all going to fit. It's a, it's a cluster. It's tight. Right. As tight as you and, and you want it that tight because otherwise it'd take it more open space. Oh, yeah. No, we should have been. What time is this one coming up? Yeah. You know, what time okay. we can we be high? Um, eight and eight thirty. Um, you have to numbers. I'm just going to ask. Um, okay, public right. hearing, Aquifer and Water Resource District, Special Permits, 39 Air Road. The Town Littleton Planning Board will hold a public hearing on Thursday, December 10th, 2015 at 8 p.m. You guys want to read this? Oops, sorry. There's a question. There's a question uh, whether we can open or not. What's that? There's only three of us. Oh, well, you can... <laughs> <laughs> and, and then We're the, it's, it's always up to the applicant um, if they want to move forward with less than a, a full board. Um, you can present, and then um, the two members that are missing can review the tape and vote at the next meeting. Um, didn't realize until just a little while ago that um, we didn't have four members. Um, so that's that's. So you want to test the waters as as per? Are you doing both of these, Bruce? Both what? No. Are you only doing the first one? Yeah. Just doing the first one. <coughs> um, <coughs> that's the story, right? We'd, we'd like to go through it and let them review the tape. Um, Little and Light and Water yeah. is trying, it's it's a pretty simple, straightforward application, and they're trying to get out to bid first of the year so they can get a spring construction. So uh, it would be nice to. Go before the three of you and hear what you have to say. And if you're good, then hopefully everybody can review the tape and yeah. we can be in and out at the beginning of the next meeting. It's probably a safe bet. To okay, then I'll continue. Ready? Continue, please. To consider the application of special permits pursuant to Master Journal Law Chapter 40A and the Code of the Town of Littleton and Zoning. The application is for an aquifer and water resource district special permit under se Section 173-61 through 173-64. Of the code of the town, Littleton, town of Littleton zoning. 39 Air Road assesses map U43 parcels 1, 1A, and 2. The applicant is the Littleton Electric Light and Water Department. The applicant is seeking to modify a prior water resource district special permit to construct a 16,730 square foot building instead of the previously approved 9,000 
square foot storage area and associated drainage improvements. Application and plans can be viewed at the Planning Board of Towns Clerk Office during business hours. Any person interested in witness wishing to be heard on the proposed plan should appear at the time and place designated or provide comment to MTU. See, that's kind of funny to read it like that, huh? There you go. Yeah. M2 Hill at littletonmass.org or P.O. Box 1305, Littleton Mass 1460, by December 9th. Your SOL on that one. Ed Mullen Clerk. Oh, Peter Scott on the side. Oh. You done? You did a good job. Move it. Okay. Bruce? Good evening. Bruce Ringwall from GPR Goldsmith Preston Ringwall. Also here this evening representing um, the architects, Helen Carl Architects, is uh, Craig Yanchenko. Um, Greg. <coughs> Greg's office and our office are working with the uh, Littleton Light and Water Department to modify the special permit that we did back in 2009 when we did the NEPA building. At that time, um, the proposal on the property, <coughs> we added in a the NEPA building and on the paved and gravel surface in the back of the existing uh, DPW and Littleton Light and Water buildings was proposed a 9,600 <coughs> square foot storage building. Um, over the course of time, in between now and then, they've uh, reevaluated the situation and have decided to put everything inside and store all the parts um, and pieces that they want to have, uh, expand and move some of the uh, the work phase for repair that they have over in the building that they share with the DPW over into the front of the building uh, so they can have that use over here. So the great news is is that we are within the Littleton Light, uh, within the uh, Watershed Protection District. Um, we have currently 37% impervious area and when this project is done we'll have 37% impervious area. Um, because the work is being done on existing paved areas and existing compacted gravel areas that in the original application and in our follow-up application that we did in 2009 and in keeping with all of the guidelines that we've used here in Littleton forever, um, fat gravel surfaces are considered impervious and it's been that way in all of our drainage calculations and coverage calculations to date. So within the back here, if you're ever allowed past the gates, there is a fenced-in area that had storage of transformers and various different things, and those things have all been moved out of the way to make room for this building. Um, we've deducted the 9,600 square foot building, added in the 16,700 square foot building. There's a shed in the back corner over here that's going to be removed, and that area will just be paved uh, to continue to use for storage and parking on the surface. The building itself as a slight modification from the plans that were initially submitted and that <coughs> these are the plans that were initially submitted initially facing towards air road the uh, office and small storage was to the front left the wash bay to the front right and there was an access to bring tractor trailers into the truck to allow for unloading and storage of the materials to the rear also the roof on the building was a typical hip roof building. The plans that I've given you this evening have all of that the same except for this building has re been reversed. The reason being is that they have this office area and stuff on the side closer to the other offices and space so if they're coming from the building out front there's a direct line enough to come and go all the way across. The wash bay just flips to the other side. The access that went through the, the building here has been moved to the back because on the site circulation it will allow for a truck that comes in through Littleton Light and Water's gate to come in, move, maneuver around and go in and out of the building without having to back up and move forward and such. Those are the only changes to the building, the building footprint and everything from what you look at on the site plan is identical to what's there. And on the roof of the building, because this is Littleton Light and Water, we've gone from a hip roof to a shed roof. And this shed roof will angle to the south so that they can put solar panels on it 
and take full advantage of the, the roof of the 16,000 square foot area. Very smart. Good. The goal for the building is there, we're working towards a net zero building as well. That's great. So, so those are, you'll, you'll meet or exceed the, uh, the code for the insulated, yes. uh, insulated uh, wall panels in the roof? Yes. Great. Great. So, <clears throat> as well, because there's no net in Pervious area, and because we're taking paved surface and removing it and replacing it with roof surface, it's clean water versus quote unquote dirty water from a stormwater management standpoint and from Littleton Light and Water's low impact development BMPs. So what we've done, again, because it's Littleton Light and Water, then they understand the advantages that they have. We have a site that's got a lot of gravel and allows for recharge. Even though it's not required, we're taking the roof runoff and we're recharging it into a series of galleys out here so that uh, we're going to do more recharge into the ground now than was currently happening because before it would collect into the drainage system and go into the BMPs, right. detention basins and such on the site. Now we're going to catch first flush uh, from the roof and a two year storm and many of the other storms will be caught as well. We'll be decreasing the rate of runoff and the volume of runoff from the site for all the storm levels and for the, the smaller storms, it'll all be recharged. Would you be shooting for a, a lead uh, silver or something? No, we're just going to get the net uh, certified as a net zero building. It's a little, I mean, they run hand in hand, yeah. but it's actually a more practical solution rather than just lead, because lead just gives you a certificate, yeah. but the net zero actually gives you a benefit in the fact that um, it will eliminate any all fossil fuels being used to, to energize and power the building and everything. Well, that's absolutely great. I don't see a problem. This building would be basically off the grid. Okay. Um, so this is basically really a modification. Of it's a totally building. a modification of the former special permit and yep. site plan that we did in 2009. Just doubling the size of the building. One and two thirds. The EPDM roof. I'm going to go with um, PVC instead of EPDM because we've been. We're using looking into that. Is what, I mean, part of the problem with the PVC sometimes is they're when they get moist or wet, they're much slipperier than the. Um, oh, they're very slippery. Yes, and so we're we're looking into that. We're also working with the uh, solar manufacturers mm -hmm. to see the exact mounting system on there because this will probably be a ballasted system. On it yeah. shouldn't be a big problem, but um, we are looking into that. We're, uh, we're, I'm on the building committee, and, and we've uh, developed the town standard where we, nice we use uh, PVC okay. all the time, and with walkway pads, it's fully accessible. Mm -hmm. Is this going to impact the soccer parking at all? Negative. This is all the same people that are using the property now. This is gated behind. It's already gated yeah. back there. There's the the gate over here, and then the other gate, and as you're aware. Uh, NEPA has got an arrangement with the soccer that on the weekends they have passed to open up and park in the NEPA parking area and vice versa during the midweek. So, that no, there's no new employees. It's just with all the issues that we have with uh, theft and everything and controlling the environment, we're putting all of the supplies under the roof rather than on the open. Can we not take not to step in your toes? Can we continue this till next month, or do you want a decision tonight? Well, I can't get a decision because we're minus a person. Right? Yeah. So I have no problem with it. I assume to take a vote right now and let the well, other two guys decide. We need it. Uh, actually, it's a special if, if only three of you vote on it, I cannot issue the special permit because it has to have four votes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we have to wait. Yeah. So just so, having your strong <laughs> vote is good. And um, in good. the interim, we will modify the site plan to reflect the flip of the building because it moves the. Uh, store, the sewer, septic connection from this side to this side and the holding tank for the wash bay to the other side. So we'll make those minor modifications to the plan. We'll have it on tomorrow and hopefully you guys can have us first on the agenda in the next meeting. And we'll you said forward. there's a wash bay in it? I'm sorry, I missed that first. There meeting. is a wash bay located here, now it'll be located over there. And there's a drain on the floor for that? The drain in the floor and there is a, going to be a 1500 gallon uh, separation and a tight tank, yes. I do that. Great. I'm good. I'm good. We're okay. My blessing. Yeah. Right. I'm sure you'll come back with uh, all the right information for storage of chemicals and stuff like that. Goes? Just so I could report back to uh, Scott Edwards, um, the next town or the next um, board meeting is? Um, January 14th. Um, we'll put this on at the beginning of the meeting. Yep. I'm not sure if we start at 7 or 7.30. Okay. It'll depend on their schedule. Yeah, continue yep. it till. See you. See you guys on the, on the fourteenth. 
Thank you. Yeah. Put it out to bed. Be done with it. Thank you, sirs. Go away. Yeah. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> Okay, yeah. thank you. All right, next up. 8.30. And we're uh, I gotta read almost back on, on track here. Another another special permit. We got... Um, okay. It's got to be read. We got five minutes to go. This one might be a little more difficult. Public hearing, uh, air road. It was dark truck with a cherry or something. Good. So, Bruce, is there any is there any way you can... In, Include some kind of overflow parking for the in this old design. There is overflow parking already in the other part, not not under this site. We're not this whole thing going to be red. Byron, do we want to give them the option, or so we just okay? Option one. Well, we don't have four people to open up a special okay. permit. Mm -hmm. But we got everybody. We got a. Okay. See, that's the problem. Yeah. Unless, uh, unless they choose to, and then... Well, I think they have everybody here. We probably should. Mullet and, you know, an accept a mullinization of the two members. Oh, yeah. Well, you can... Why, we should have conceded if MacGyver would stay as a standard. <laughs> we could have done Why didn't we think of that? Think of that. Oh, why don't we deputize somebody right yeah. now? Okay. okay. What am I doing? <laughs> The ball <laughs> 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 now I know why we're the, the uh, we, why we Do they the want highest rated okay. uh, yeah. Should be. board. Of, Would you like some candy? I almost said a little cold. Oh. So, are we going to open, Darren? Good. Okay, all right. Yep. Okay. They want to take a, you know, three minute break. And I want to go get a drink of water. There's more candy if you want. Lousy hands. Why don't you come and take one? We're going to take a three-minute break while Marin loads up the PowerPoint presentation, and it's actually uh, it'll actually put us right on target for the 8:30 public meeting. No, I'm on diet. So, I'm not eating. See you so, all. In three I'm more on minutes. diet. I'm not eating candy. How's that working out? It's working good so far. Good Been since Monday. The journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. That's right. I'm not eating. Duty calls. My mom said hi. Yep, so that one. You there? Oh, oh no, I'm not. Oh, oh. oh got you. Um, <laughs> so, we're around. You started on Monday? Yeah, I started on Monday. Huh? I started on Monday, yeah. Good for you. Yeah, not bad so far. Uh, try not to drink and I try to uh, I have to lose some and my blood pressure is with the roof yeah so it's not so much as losing that I need to lose that much 10 pounds I'm only I'm about 12 pounds more than I played football with in college I have a few more than 10 or 20 pesky pounds to get rid of well it's the last 10 that are the hardest <laughs> yeah, the first ten are the easiest. Yeah, the last ten are the hardest. First. And the funny part is that you know, everything has shifted, you know? So, Mark, what do you know about Tesla? I've seen the cars. Did you drive one? I, uh, no, I was at a, I, I didn't drive one, but I saw one. Um, they're coming down in prices, and the fast as all hell. They're great, they're a great car. The guys... They're electric. They're electric. Yeah, totally yeah. electric. You know, an, an electric car with four-wheel drive will blow any car off the road in speed. It did. Yeah. But it's, it's, it did. They're made, but the deep problems are heavy. I was coming down Mile Hill one day, doing my usual speed, mm -hmm. and got past. And when it, like I was standing still, and so there was lineup of traffic at the base of the hill. It was yellow and it was short and it was like. I got close enough to see his name on the back of it before he just disappeared again. You know that they know where that car is any time during all day long. They track their GPS. Tesla GPS is all their cars all day long. They do. They know exactly where you are. He knows what it's putting out. Knows what kind of they stuff. Every day they can monitor your well, cars. The car I was in like had um, had the, uh, the the radar screen or the the, um, the screen the GPS screen. You can you can press. 
a button on it, or and it tells you where all the nearest gas stations are. If you want to press another button, it takes you right, right to one. No, I. The charging stations. They're going to get the prices down to below sixty thousand bucks, and yeah. then then you'll see. That's my where they are now. That's my car when I get rich. Nineties, high eighties. The sports car, the little two-door yeah. coupe, they're nice. Even second hand, there, yeah. they're yeah, in the fifties and sixties. But they're, they're, they're nice. They're but, but Tesla's building more batteries, hopefully more cars. Yeah, yeah they don't um, catch on fire. But they're also oh. talking, Tesla's also talking about building batteries for your house, making your house self-sufficient, too, with his batteries. Yeah, they, 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 uh, the guy decided not to patent his battery, so everybody could, could build the same kind of battery. I think that's, a, that's terrific. He's going to make it so that you don't Just spread it. You get solar power, you get these yep. massive batteries. Piece of paper I like that. A smart guy. Candy bar. Are we back? Are we ready to uh, roll? It's up to you, Marin. I am in a planning board meeting. One minute to get back in. One minute to go. That clock's not right. All right. If we are ready to roll, are you all set, Marin? Uh, yeah. Um, do you want to drive, or do you want me to drive? Oh, it oh, will. No, uh, I got to read this, right? Yeah, we got we got to open and yeah, so. Um, all set. This is uh, this is the uh, major commercial industrial special use permit and water resource district special permit site plan modification, air liquid hydrant and depot. The Town of Littleton Planning Board will hold a public hearing on Thursday, December 10th, 2015 at 8.30 p.m. Room 103 Town Hall, 37 Shattuck Street. To consider the application of special permits pursuant to M. Master and Law Chapter 40A in the Code of Town of Littleton Zoning, Major Commercial or Industrial Use Special Permit Sections 173-86 through 173-89 and Aquifer and Water Resource District Section 173-61 through 173-64. The location is 53 Air Road. Assessors map R21, parcel 90, air, liquid, industrial, USLP, is the applicant. The applications are for one, a major commercial or industrial use, and two, water resource district special permits to remove a portion of the existing building at 53 Air Road to accommodate hydrogen storage tanks in excess for tractor trailers. This proposal involves a truck delivery of liquid hydrogen, LH2, which will be offloaded into horizontal 15,000 gallon sites Cryogen, genetic, genetic, sorry. Tanks, LH2 will be pumped and vaporized into gaseous hydrogen GH2 that will load into tube trailers. The tube trailers will then deliver the GH2 from the site to retail automotive hydrogen fueling stations in the Northeast region. Application and plans can be viewed at the planning board and town clerk's office during the business hours. Any person interested wishing to be heard on the application should appear at the time and place designated written comments may be submitted by email to m2hill at littletonmass.org by 4 p.m. on Wednesday, December 9th, or by regular <coughs> mail to the planning board office. Ed Mullen, clerk. Peter well, Scott filling in. Peter, you did a wonderful job there. Thank you. Talk as fast as I do, and we'll get along fine. <laughs> it's, he, gets, he gets this way when it gets late. <laughs> yeah. um, Time is money. Well, who's here to present for on the behalf of Air Liquid? I'm just giving a brief introduction. My name is Andrea McCarthy. I'm mm -hmm. from the law offices of Jerry Efron, and we represent FIBA Technologies. Um, as you recall, I believe all three of you were on the board at the time in 2012 when we were in here for both the, um, the Water Resource District Special Permit as well as the Site Plan Modification, which is exactly what um, Air Liquid is going for this evening. They are now one of the tenants in our building. We're still the primary tenant. We've entered into a lease arrangement with Air Liquide, um, and they're going to present tonight. We're here for their support um, for the permits, as well as if there's any questions um, of the landlord. That's great. Uh, good evening. My name is Joseph <laughs> Rollins. I work for Black & Beach. We're the engineering firm hired by <clears throat> Air Liquide to uh, zone and permit and uh, construct, design uh, the facility that's uh, up for discussion tonight. Uh, I have with me lead engineer Dave Lugin, Jason Mitchell from Air Liquide will give a presentation on the power port and uh, any questions you may have after that. Great. Next. 
Well, thank you very much for having us. Um, is, this, a, is this Jason? I'm Jason Mitchell, okay. yes, and I'm with Air Liquide, and I will be the operations manager for um, hydrogen energy facilities for Air Liquide in the U.S. Great. Um, so uh, we've got a brief presentation here. Okay, do you, do you want to run the presentation? Um, or would you? Yeah, we can do that. Yeah. If that's okay, yeah. sure. Yeah. No, I would just assume you do it, but if you want to move that over, you could. Okay. Um, so a bit on Air Liquide. Um, it's kind of hard to read here, but uh, in general, Air Liquide is an international company, and we have about, uh, we operate in three countries, we have about 50,000 employees, about 5,000 here in the U.S. And um, Air Liquide's been in business since 1902, so a well-established company. Um, revenue is about 15 billion euros, and um, a key point is that you know, Air Liquide has, um, you know, in its principles and guiding, we're saying that you know, life, um, our solutions that protect life and envir environment, our gases are used. You know, the sales, about 40% of our sales, are used in applications that support life, so healthcare and the environment. Um, so Air Liquide has several businesses. We have an engineering and construction arm that will build our primary production facilities. So Air Liquide does also operate um, our primary production or large industries facilities. Main products that are generated are oxygen, nitrogen, argon, hydrogen. Um, and then from the production, we do operate filling centers. And that's what we'll have here at, um, in Littleton. We'll have a filling center. We'll bring in liquid hydrogen that is produced at one of our facilities. We'll store it at Little Tin, and we'll process it into packaged gas in a tube trailer, pressurize it, um, vaporize it, and pressurize it. So we also operate, uh, so kind of our, our market segments, we have industrial merchant, we have healthcare, and electronics are our main um, market segments that we operate inside of. <clears throat> okay, so a bit on hydrogen recharging. So. It's pretty exciting. This is um, new technology, you know, for that um, that we're moving towards, looking to really go move towards a hydrogen economy. And part of the hydrogen economy is using hydrogen as um, fuel for for vehicles. So part of the reason is to basically reduce CO2 emissions and use fuel cells, you know, in this. Um, Air Liquide has multiple applications already where we have done. Uh, basically the retail fueling stations or the vehicle fueling itself. Um, one of them is BC Transit bus fleet. We were involved in the um, Olympics that were up in Whistler um, years back, um, demonstration project. Another one, General Motor Motors Project, which was another demonstration type of project. Um, and then we also do hydrogen forklifts fueling. So we do have applications with Coca-Cola and Procter & Gamble where we supply hydrogen for their forklift fleets. So they've gone away from batteries and are using um, fuel cells for their vehicles, or for their forklifts. And now what we're talking about is really, on the vehicle side, moving away from kind of some of the demonstration projects and bus pro projects to really more of what we're hoping to be more mainstream applications. Okay, so hydrogen safety um, Air Liquide is operated with hydrogen. It's one of our core products that we deliver and um, to our customers. They're very familiar with the codes that are required to do this safely. So construction codes, NFPA codes, electrical codes. Um, equipment used in this is to ASME specifications. All the electrical equipment is UL or equivalent certified. Um, and we have safety systems involved, built into our systems, engineered into our systems procedurally. Um, we have double block and bleeds for maintenance so we can isolate equipment safely, maintain it. Um, and in this project, there's no deviations or variations to any codes that we're pursuing. Okay, so this project in particular um, one of the impetuses is for this is a contract that Air Liquide signed with Toyota in about this time last year to supply hydrogen 
up in the northeast northeast area for their future their upcoming Mirai vehicle, which they have just recently begun um, delivering to customers in California. So Air Liquide is also involved in California and actively pursuing and installing fueling stations there as well. So. Um, the amount of fueling stations that we're going to have up here in the Northeast justifies having basically these distribution centers, one in the Littleton area and one down in the New York City area. So this is the Littleton distribution center that we're going to bring our liquid hydrogen in, <coughs> fill into tube trailers, which would then go deliver to the hydrogen vehicle, uh, hydrogen fueling stations in the area. Okay, so located on the Littleton site, we're, we're going to have, these are the main pieces of equipment. We're going to have a 15,000 gallon liquid hydrogen um, storage vessels. We're going to have cryogenic pumps, as Peter had said. Um, they will be into vaporizers and then into, high into basically dispensers, which will then fill tube trailers. So in and out of the property, we're going to have hydrogen, liquid hydrogen deliveries and then be delivering out gaseous hydrogen. Um, we're going to have 24-7 remote monitoring of the system. Um, the site will be staffed to a degree, um, probably shift work, um, 8 or 12 hours. Uh, when it's fully ramped up, we'll have approximately 10 individuals operating out of the, the facility, which would include the truck drivers. Um, initially, we're going to have 1,080 kilograms per day. And the truck deliveries, once we're at that capacity, is about um, delivering five two, two trailers out of the site per day and um, two liquid hydrogen deliveries into the site. Um, we're going to have both active and passive safety systems. <coughs> okay. So here is, here is the, the location of the site. Um, this is uh, the FIBA facility. So it is up in the northernmost kind of section and where the kind of yellow hatched area is. It's hard to see behind that, but behind that basically, or behind the yellow hatch, is an existing canopy structure, just a roof that will be removed and the, the installation will be on that side. And here is a bit of a, a drawing of what the site is and with the canopy removed, there's going to be some parking kind of on the, the upper north uh, western section or south western uh, liquid hydrogen vessel, and then we're going to have five dispensers. The line kind of um, going up to the five dispensers is a pipe rack overhead. Okay. So here's a bit of uh, a rendering before and after. So looking into the end of the, the open canopy in the upper left, that would be removed and looking straight into it. Closest to us, the blue um, items would be the dispensers, the row of dispensers, and then the background is the horizontal liquid hydrogen vessel. Um, to the kind of left is the, the, the vaporizer. You have five dispensers, so at one point in time you have five trucks filling up at one point. That's correct. Um, our specification right now is to be able to fill five trailers in a 12-hour period. So that was our design requirement to our engineering group. Uh, this isn't, this isn't a 50 gallons of your way. This is thousands of... I read the thing earlier. It's uh, Each truck carries how many? About 400 kilograms right. each truck. Yeah. How long does it take to fill the truck? So if we're filling five of them, it'll take about 12 hours. If you're only filling one, it'll take you know, a fifth of that time approximately. Is it because you can only feed it that fast? Um, so we sized our pump based on the requirement of filling five in 12 hours. And the, thought, so, yeah, the thought process is, is that um, during a certain time of the day, the trucks may be out for delivery, and then they may all come back and be filled basically in the off hours of mm -hmm. when they're not making deliveries. We don't, um, you know, we're going to have to figure out exactly how the best um, routing and, you know, delivery schedule is for the retail fueling, because Air Liquide, this is new to us, delivering really to the retail vehicle fueling stations, so. Throughout New England. Throughout New England. Yeah. yeah. 
And here is just another um, perspective of the installation. So the proposed routing of the vehicles is they're going to come up distribution way and take a right, come into the property, into this would be one of the two trailers that would be making, that would be being filled, and then it would be a drive-through, which is basically our desire, and one of the reasons that we've decided to make a modification, actually take the canopy down to allow us to do a drive-through. Our distribution group, it's much more safe than having to back up into the area. Um, and then this other view, this would be the, the liquid truck to, to deliver into it. I believe this may be the last slide that I Is have. Is that exit, the, that one there, the exit where the truck's going out? That is, that's over near um, where new, new Estate comes out, is that right? They're going to circle no. around the building, is that no. what they're going to do? No, that's Distribution Center Circle. Goes past uh, the new Popery Warehouse and past the old... So we'll come back out and around, back to the Bay Right, right and then back down the Distribution Center Drive. I knew that. <laughs> Okay. Any any additional presentation? Um, no additional presentation. No. Um, any comments from uh, the public? Or fire department. You want input from the fire department soon? Oh, that's right. It's Scott. Um, I actually uh, we spoke prior to the meeting. We had a, a short list of uh, of concerns, and um, I believe that's those are some of the items that they're going to uh, they're going to address. Um, one of them just was the driving pattern, yeah. um, and so those. But, um, no, uh, no major issues right now. What about suppression of fire and all that stuff? It's obviously the state, the filling station. So those going to have some form of fire. There will, there will be detection. There'll be detection on them. Um, the yeah. hydrogen. I mean, we all said it's. Uh, if that burns, that I mean, it's quicker than it's not like a gas station. Um, yeah. Okay. With hydrogen, okay. um, you don't you don't suppress it with with water. Um, the way that the system is is um, engineered and designed is there's vent stacks, so and there's flame detectors. So if there is a flame detected, um, it will go into its emergency shutdown condition. The appropriate valves will shut down the filling operation, shut down the pumps, and the other appropriate valves will go into a fail open position and vent the product um, up. In through the vent stacks, so that's part of the design process, and yep. that's a standard design process for hydrogen. Let's say that happens. How much stuff are you pump it into the air? How much stuff? How much, well, how much, how much hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen capable of pumping into the air? Well, under, under those circumstances, it's a fifteen thousand gallon tank. So in the worst case, if the main tank safety lifted, you'd have fifteen thousand gallons of hydrogen that would go up, and, and its effect on. It would, buggers running around here. It would combust into into water, so that is basically after it goes through the fuel cell, it'll become water itself. So if it goes into the air and if it does ignite, it'll turn into water. And um, the, the the vent stacks are sized for those conditions, so we 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 have them engineered and designed for the worst case scenarios. What happens if it doesn't ignite? If it doesn't ignite, then and that's often the case as well. Um, it, and it will just dissipate in the atmosphere. It's much more buoyant than regular air, <coughs> so it goes up into the atmosphere. It becomes it's part of our atmosphere. Yeah, it's, because not, a, it's, it's not a pollutant. It's, it's yeah. hydrogen's the yeah. most abundant molecule yeah. in the yeah. you know in the universe. That's the Hindenburg thing. Oh, don't mm -hmm. talk about the Hindenburg. <laughs> this is a. I got it. I got to say a couple that questions. You know, I um, I had the opportunity um, in October uh, as part of the um, national. Co code, uh, building code um, uh, review process, I'm a member of that, and to take a day-long uh, seminar on hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, and we actually had a chance to drive uh, two of them yeah. and visit a, a fuel cell, vis visit the Toyota main uh, campus that has a hydrogen, uh, hydrogen gas station, you might say. And uh, to see their uh, the, the Toyota's campus backup power plant, which is basically a hydrogen, two hydrogen fuel cells, big fuel cells that mm -hmm. are the backup plant for the whole Toyota campus. 
Um, it, was, it was very interesting. The cars drove very um, smoothly, just like an electric car. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the, the, the descriptions for how the cars are, are made and built um, seem to be, well, they got me, me over the fence. Yeah, this, uh, I'm, I'm very uh, pleased with this. So only five deliveries a day and two into the plant a week, so the traffic will be minimal. Yeah, that's the current forecast we have to be able to release. Will the trucks be cold? I mean, I know if you use CNG or um, you're setting nitrogen and stuff, the trucks have to be refrigerated or cold. Are these going to be, are these just like tanker trucks? Yeah, yeah. Um, there might not be, you know, you'll probably see quite a few, maybe Air Liquide trucks, um, Air Products, Lindy, you know, there's a lot of, we distribute a lot of our air gases as liquids, as cryogenic liquids. And it's a double wall vessel, it's like a thermos, basically it insulates, um, and it, it's basically because to make efficient deliveries and move enough and as many molecules as you can, yeah. well, liquid is more efficient. So it's a common it's a common form of, of delivery. So it'll look like a nitrogen chuck. Well, L yeah. LNG. Yeah. Yeah. That's LNG. Just a, yeah. 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 So and the, and right now we have LNG vehicles all over all over Eastern Mass. The buses in Boston are all LNG, and the fuel facilities for them are all LNG, liquid night uh, liquid. This one has a. Uh, Natural gas, and yes. this, this would be very similar to that, so, uh, much less explosive. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good. Oh, we have a yes. Could you identify yourself? My name yes. is Don O'Neill from Condine. Yes, and we we are the owners of uh, one distribution and three distribution drive, as well as the road around the entire loop there. Um, I guess we have some concerns. We're, uh, concerns. We're all pro business. We like like what, what we see today. But some of the concerns are uh, things that should be addressed. Um, and the first one I think is we have uh, additional three to four hundred people coming into that industrial park when P and G is uh, PGI is completed. We have a little concern about the truck route and the hairpin turn that you have up there that is crossing over the median to make the swing into your lease site. And we've had uh, concerns prior with our tenants trying to make trucks go straight and go all the way around and come back from a tra traffic flow standpoint so the pedestrian car the cars uh, won't have an uh, issue coming around. To me, it looks like we're creating a little bit of a bottleneck right there that, that could jeopardize someone not looking or running into a tanker truck. So that's one of my first concerns. When we convey the loop road over to the town, currently we are maintaining that road at our expense with shared cost uh, to everybody um, who accesses that road. Currently, we pay for the plowing, all the maintenance, the landscaping. Um, at, at, um, within a year or so, we're going to convey that road over the town and work with the town. At that point, what concerns or liabilities does the town have when that happens? So that's a, another concern. The other concern is I see where you fuel up, and then I see where you exit. Looking at the documents, I understand where your lease is and the surrounding areas. The concern is when you exit, you're just going to exit over existing gravel, cobblestones, come up to a transition of uh, anywhere from one to three feet, and get onto the, the road again, just on gravel. At what point does the road keep getting abused without no, as no asphalt in that area or transition, dragging stones out on the, on the, on the main drag, uh, the dust. These are some of the concerns. We spent a significant amount of money. We've, we've had a great relationship with the town. Fever's a great tenant, or not a tenant, a, a great uh, neighbor, and has done wonders with that facility. 
what is the next phase? There's going to be a lot in between there that eventually is maybe just storage yard for FIBA or another development on his land. Just some of the concerns that we have. And we're all pro-business here and we've, uh, we're down to the end wire on what we're doing in cleaning up the area and, and, it's, and it's starting to really feel like a business area. So that's uh, some of our concerns. We've mm -hmm. built CNG facilities, know a little bit about this. We know the time it takes to fill these trailers. You just don't fill them and then, and then they go. So those are some of my concerns and in, in, in what happens coming forward. Safety number one um, for the, the current people there and the future people coming. And, uh, I don't know if that's been designed for that type of hairpin turn, crossing over a yellow line in medium. And, and maybe that's something you can look at. I know you have a drainage ditch before that, so it's hard to cross over a drainage ditch. You know, we've looked at, you know, what if they pulled the road back, pulled the parking down, would that help them? Would that help us alleviate that concern? Uh, so I'm representing and one of the owners of the other two buildings, so those are open concerns that I have. Well, Michael, you've done, you and your, your company have done a tremendous job back in there. Uh, I think everything you've brought to the town has really been terrific, and these comments will, will go fully noted, I'm sure. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments from anybody in the audience? <coughs> Sure. Um, Sam Stoney, New Estate Road. I'm uh, one of the closest neighbors to mm -hmm. this uh, this building. And I guess first I want to emphasize a lot of what you said. We're, we're definitely uh, pro-business and, and pro-everything that's going on in that park. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of being part of the hydrogen economy is, uh, is something that appeals to the green side of me. Um, I'm familiar with their Lakeith from my work and I think they'd be a great neighbor. Uh, my concern is uh, one of noise. Um, FIBA is also a great neighbor, and yet in spite of their best efforts and our efforts, um, we're still not meeting either state or local noise ordinances. Um, I don't, I don't want to see that happen all over again with uh, a new potentially good neighbor. And what I'd ask is that either you consider or the town consider requesting that we get a, an independent third party to do a noise audit. Uh, and to take a look at the current conditions, uh, assess all the different actions that are going to be going on there, and its impact on the local the local noise environment. Um, I'm particularly concerned because a lot of the issues that we have at FIBA are, are with regard to the pressurizing and discharging of gases, and clearly that's your main business. Uh, it's a it's a highly disruptive sort of sound if it's not controlled. So I'd like to uh, like to make absolutely sure that we know what we're getting into before the plant's built there. So that's a great, absolutely great uh, comment, and I'm sure it'll go duly noted. So when they come back again, we'll we'll have some uh, we'll have an ad that uh, comment addressed. Um, great, thank you, Jim. How do you feel about that corner they're talking about? What a turn now. <laughs> Jim, you're on the heat. Uh, yeah, I was trying to move on. Um, I too had concerns about designing something that you're going into the other lane, each, you know, in and out. Um, I'm concerned about the sharp turn, digging up the pavement over time, and the same as Don said with coming out onto the pavement. It seems like there needs to be some kind of formal in and out. Um, there's already been trouble on that corner with the guardrails, been hit once or twice just by the, you know, I guess it's a pretty tight corner. Um, I thought you were going to say snowplow. No, nope, it's been hit by trucks yeah. going in. I'm not saying uh, if we take it over, it's not going to get hit because there's no place to put the snow because it's all guardrail. Yeah. So you've got to have a place to do it. Um, I think I noticed on the plan, too, you show an 80 foot right away on distribution circle. I pull up the old plans, it looks like it's a 50 foot right away. Not that really matters. But, um, and one of the other plans you had showed like a, a drain line going underneath the road on one of the plans but not on the other plan, just a little bit confusing. 
It was on one of the colored prints. Um, Dave might be able to speak to that. All right, we got Phoebus here, correct? Do you mind if I ask mm -hmm. a question or two here? Oh, please. All right, so if um, the corner can be addressed, either widening it, also uh, raising the grade of the existing property to meet the exit that you have, and as opposed to, and yeah. are you talking or am I? Just, just curious. Well, are you well, done? Well. Just tell me, am I done? I was thinking out loud, Peter. Well, let's stop that. <laughs> uh, so that they we don't have the gravel issue getting pulled back out in the street so and and i forgot your name sir don don again the corner the uh the the, the exit to the street and getting it to an even grade and maybe even the entrance to it be the same exit you said you don't like to to back into them but if you pull in forward to get the to get filled then backing away from it to go out the same point is that is that does that make any of these exits any easier that you can tell? I or guess on, on, if it was to exit where it's entering, I think that will probably cause even a worse situation. But I mean, coming in from the other side. I mean, where they're exiting, come in from where they're exiting and go out the same same way, backing out into an open space over here. See where they're coming in. This is where they're exiting, correct? Right. So if they went in that way, and they filled up and they simply backed over to here and went back out the same way they came that eliminates that corner entirely right yes it does and then this is where you say where they they come from a three foot downgrade up onto the road if that is is paved or a decent area through uh FIBA or their construction site however it is that would alleviate a lot of that right that is correct and as far as the under under um culverts running underneath to address exactly where they are so that you know that doesn't become an issue and we also have a water two water wells tanks or observation tanks to what uh, holes, holes, yeah. wells what the well, water 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 yeah. wells. that's the word yeah um, and you're going to fix those has, right has agreed to to replace those pdq <laughs> pretty damn quick <laughs> <laughs> Someone sends me these PDQs on the computer. I don't know how to open them. I don't know what they mean. I just leave them alone. So. Okay. Good. Your turn. I'm all done. I think it's a great technology. I'm, I'm uh, behind it 100%. How is the technology? You want to see if they can make the thing work with everyone um, making them happy? Yeah. The, um, um, it's, it's a good, seems to be a, a, a decent layout. Okay. Uh, um, I, uh, there was some written comments submitted by one of the residents. So I'll make sure that that's part of the um, record. Um, I haven't, haven't forwarded that yet. I will I'll okay. do that. Yeah. Um, and you just got that this evening. And as far as the, the noise concern, if it's if it's already an issue now, and he says they're not meeting state or local, maybe we can look into some way to make something quieter. The only jurisdiction the town has is the, uh, over the local bylaw. Yeah. Um, but certainly that's something that you um, should, should address. The question is how you want to propose. He was, he was working on that. And mm -hmm. I just don't want to start the whole thing with another group. I think that we could have saved a lot of trouble if we had looked at this before the construction. Uh, so let's dip the problems in the bud. Um, I don't think it's impossible to deal with. Good. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Nice. Something like that, I'm sure, was a manageable issue. Right. We have a cost estimate from Green to review um, what's been proposed, but it doesn't include any noise work. Uh, one of the questions I have for you is whether you, or not, um, after you look at Green's proposal, if you wanted to, to go ahead with that uh, peer review. Um, it was for what, the drainage and the access. Yeah, I mean, it was for, I mean, it was for those, uh, the full compliance for those two special permit applications and then. Uh, yeah. And, and including the, the stormwater. I, I would absolutely say we need to have a peer review on the on the uh, site conditions uh, from our, our geotech. Okay. Um, so if you could uh, manage this and mm -hmm. and are you are you gentlemen opposed to having a, a peer review? You'll be picking up the tab for it. I'd have to defer to our probably our engineering company. Yeah. On there. Well, that's something that Marin can work out with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep, I was able to share the uh, proposal with them, and if there's any questions about that, please, yeah. we'll, we'll work on that. Yeah, great. Um, as far as um, noise monitoring, the peer review didn't include anything um, to that. Do we want to it, wait for more information to be submitted and see how to address that? It, it did not, and, and it's up to you, um, 
What, do you think that there's a there'll be a noise factor with this installation? And if it's there really is, really leave that up to him because you'll say no if he's smart. Well, <laughs> well let's, uh, let's just thank you. <laughs> so why don't we? Uh, we're we're aware that there there's there's a current challenge um, and the proximity of our installation versus the current noise source is further away from. So I think the proximity itself just uh, may lend itself to not being so acute on the noise. And the way that the, the system operates, the way that the vessel is filled is different. There's not a, a brass knuckle cover that needs to be um, manipulated to do the fill. It's more of a Class bayonet, so that does not. Uh, I don't think he's worried about the the whack of a brass. You're still opening and closing 3,500 pound, 3,500 psi tanks, right? So the the liquid vessel is usually sitting at about 100 or 125 psi. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and and the way that it vents is is different than 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 the the air gases, um, the nitrogen or the oxygen, because of the vent stacks. So inherently, those vent stacks. Do have some muffling effect <coughs> noise. So some. There will be some noise in our operations, yes. Okay. I do understand the steamer let off. <laughs> That's fun to hear. You should hear a nitrogen right. tank break. <laughs> um, so I think I oh, think we Yeah, I'm I'm pretty confident that these are issues can be dealt with, but I would be much more comfortable if uh, if a third party took a look and went through every part of the operation. Well as long as we're here, how does the uh FIBA sound feel about that? About what Air the Beat's doing, or uh, about doing uh, footing the bill for an for a uh, sound quality? Well, we test. can discuss it and get back to you. Um, sure. I don't know if the company that the Green Company is necessarily equipped to be doing a noise study. No, someone separate from right. The, so yeah. I mean, yeah, we have a different yeah. consultant. We'll get for that. back to Marin on that. Yeah. yeah. All right. Good. Thanks. I would I would just suggest that there's a, a great benchmark in what um, Aggregate did in 2012, I think. That's right. Uh, the study, that what they did really covered all the bases, uh, and before they even started building, uh, I think we and all the neighbors knew what to expect, uh, and it made the, the transition painless. That's absolutely right. They did a, they did a preliminary sound uh, from various spots, and, and then they fall it up at the end. <clears throat> you must know from your other applications where you do this what your decibel levels are uh, as you f as you drain the tanks and as you fill the tanks. Can you at least give us what we could expect as a benchmark for the normal operation of this, and we can go from there to decide whether or not we need to have further testing done. Yeah, I think that's something we can look into. Uh, we have uh, Jimmy. I just. Um, Hours of operation, are you a seven day a week operation, 24 hour a day filling or? Initially, it's going to be slow. It's going to be, it's basically going to depend on how the ramp up is of the, of the hydrogen vehicles because it's going to depend on how much. So initially we won't have the five trailers. We'll probably have one or two and we'll ramp up. Um, what was presented here was basically our our full capacity case, so. Because some of the other neighbors on the back buildings complain <coughs> about the uh, traffic trucks <coughs> at the dumpsters in the morning between the backup alarms and banging of the dumpster. So that's a concern of other neighbors on other, uh, other facilities. So that's why I was, you know, it looks like you're pulling through, there shouldn't be a lot of backup alarms, but. I noticed and appreciated, appreciated that. I noticed and appreciated that there wasn't any backing up yet. Yeah. You don't have my suggestion, huh? Again, that's a um, no. That's a that's a concern that I think we, it's duly noted now, and uh, can be looked at and, and addressed if it's if it's needed. Just, oh yes. Just to follow up with the when when it is five trucks a day, is that meaning also at night, early in the morning, maximum capacity. So Considering that we're still hopefully still living in our house five years from now. Yeah. Um, right now, we're not sure of when we, when is going to be the best time to distribute hydrogen to the vehicle filling stations. So right now, it could be we don't have our operation plan established, mm -hmm. um, but it could be the way that we're looking at it is we could be flexible to basically 
full during the night, deliver during the day, okay. or vice versa. Uh -huh. yeah. well, there are, of course, different um, uh, different uh, noise allowable noise levels, you know, for night, weekends, and during the day. So if there will be some noise issues associated with your operation, that is to be basically met, you know, these limits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's correct. They yeah. have to meet the noise bylaw, and it, there is a differentiation between uh, daytime and nighttime and weekend noise levels that are allowed. That's right. That they'll have to meet. Is the reason you're leaving it open because you want to vent it if something happens? Well, you mean the roof? Yeah. Well, it's wide open. It's uh, it looks it like it'll be removed, right? The roof is going to be the whole structure. Right. Is so it's gonna, down. my point is it's wide open right now. So it just sits. You, the truck sits out in the open tarmac and fills or, or empties, right? The vent is a safety, you know, a safety uh, device or one of the safety devices, and that's not going to be regulated no matter what we do to a time of day. Well, the point I'm trying to get at is why can't you make it so that you actually do pull into a building to lessen the noise and don't have a roof to it? Oh, pull into a building. We considered that, and that was really one of the initial ambitions was to maintain that roof structure. But there's a lot of safety concerns and really code concerns about doing building of this nature. I mean, there are forklift applications where we do forklifts inside, but there is a whole different set of safety concerns, especially since the hydrogen rises. So if you have it, you know, if you don't have the, the structure, that's... I'm thinking good. more for noise. If you put no. the walls up... Right, well, Bas the basically the answer is it won't meet fire code? Yeah. You have, you have it's an issue when it's confined. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, that's the bottom line. No, but if you leave the roof off... No, if you... The roof. If there's no roof, then there's no confinement. Right? That's my point. And it's no issue. So if you have walls around it, at least when you're filling the, you know, if you have a 25 foot tall building all around it, and you're filling the truck down below in the middle of it, the noise is not going to carry. It'll still carry out the roof a little bit, but not like if it was wide open there, so that they can fill all night because it's essentially inside a building. Well, um, Mark, I think to to that comment, they. You know, there in construction, you have uh, acoustical screens you can put around things that help dampen things yeah. if there is a need for it. All these questions are why well, I think it'd be a really good idea to involve a, a professional noise consultant on this. But I think there are answers, uh, and there are experts that know the answers. I think yeah. we need to find out what kind of noise it does make. Yeah, yeah we have to first start there. Um, I think that, and there will be discussion on getting our, our acoustical consultant back and getting an estimate from them for. for just that. And if we need to, then we can go down that route. Okay. Great. So, we're going to continue this uh, hearing. That's a... Thank you. To the... Well, the next um, peer, hearing date you have is January 14th. Um, <coughs> the question is whether or not you want to be continued to that one or till a later date. And the uh, site we, visit. We might want to do a site visit as well. You. Let's touch base with that. I'll, I'll let you know for sure. Okay, so uh, okay, so you have to you do have to continue to date certain. Yeah. Um, continue till January fourteenth, right. and then between now and then, um, we'll figure out if you're ready for that date yeah. or if you want to just. Okay, stand. Sounds good. All right. So thank you. Do you have thank a motion, you. motion to continue the hearing? Thank you. Thank you. January fourteenth. Yep. Second. We have a motion to continue it to the 14th. We have a so moved. In favor. Motion to second. So moved. We are all going to do a, a site visit. Motion to close the meeting. We can schedule a site visit. How are you doing? Um, should be. You guys are probably going to get thirty in the afternoon. I pick my kid on certain days or any day while there. But what, what works for you? Because I'm you flexible. Wait for the further, further along, or you want to do it before the well, geez, you know, The snow's not on the ground yet. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. I had a meeting tonight at, at six o'clock, and it's not happening. So I don't know. Are we done with this? Yeah, yeah we'll. Let's let's schedule that by email.